Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. We've got a real hot topic today, a couple of them actually. Uh, we have our normal panelists here, which I will introduce in a moment. I've got a special announcement here from uh, subscribers to Pinecone and Utopia channel on YouTube. We've gotten some word from some of our subscribers that their subscriptions are being deleted. Uh, so you might want to check and see if you're still subscribed to Pinecone Utopia channel because somehow I don't want to blame anybody. Somehow they're, they're getting deleted. So you have to kind of stay on top of that and monitor it if you want to be informed when we issue new videos and be invited every Thursday morning to the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Okay, today we've got our normal panelists here, our investigation team. We've got Dr. Millicent Black, who's been uh, in the program for 20 some years. Uh, being bombarded by voice to skull technology, uh, radio weapons, microchipped. Uh, then we have uh, Karen Melton Stewart, uh, an NSA whistleblower who is also being constantly hit by energy weapons. And uh, she's going to talk today about her interactions with the militia in Maryland. And then we have Dr. Catherine Horton a particle physicist from CERN who got on the list by uh, being attentive in a uh, court case that happened in the, United, in the United Kingdom. And then, of course, as always, we have Ramola D. Uh, she's our celebrity. She's a, a famous writer and uh, also a, a target. And... Uh, her targeting is very interesting because it's taking place in a big city and she's surrounded by perks. So welcome to the welcome to the technical uh, the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Today, the general outline for topics are we want to delve into Melison Black's case in depth. Uh, Ramola just finished writing it. It's on her site, which is Everyday Concerned Citizen. Uh, Dot, uh, dot net. Dot net. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about uh, Karen's interaction with the Maryland militia. So, so we can get started. Uh, Karen, do you want to get the militia stuff out of the way? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll do the minor stuff first. <laughs> okay. Um, I had... Uh, contacted Chris Dorsey, who I saw advertise himself as the head of the Maryland and Virginia militia, because I wanted to talk to him about the militia coming maybe to the aid of targeted individuals, since this includes um, infractions in law that are very serious. And he invited me to speak on his uh, phone program, which he calls uh, Militia Intelligence Report. And I sat and listened for a while, and then he introduced me. And my idea with that, with that group was to tell them that, look, you know, we're dealing with weapons of war that are being utilized against citizenry. This is highly unconstitutional, highly illegal. And I would suggest that, well, he asked me, he said, what is the quickest way or, or most uh, uh, expeditious way to get this into the public knowledge that this exists? I said, frankly... You know, I could use maybe contact with five, five people in the militia. I can tell you who in the neighborhood has one of these devices. You know, maybe five uh, guys could go to the door and say, look, we're from the militia. We understand that you have a directed energy weapon. And we know for a fact that under 18 U.S. Code and various sections that these are deemed weapons of mass destruction. They are not legal for an individual, a civilian to have. And they are... Uh, also not legal for anyone to use on non-combatant civilians. So we would like you to turn the device over now. Now you can turn it over to us, or we can sit here and wait for the FBI or some such agency to come out and, and take it from you. And he seemed to be very receptive. The people didn't say much, you know, and that was my honest opinion as to how to quickly do this instead of laboriously going through courts and having how many people die in the meantime. And I said, this is the quickest way to say, look, here is one. 
and we can demonstrate it for you. This is true. It's factual. Somebody's got to do something for, about it. And then later, like a day or two later, I get an email from him that was accusing us of having Russian contacts and wanting them to do something illegal to get arrested so that I must be indeed an agent from the government trying to set them up. Uh, well, Karen, I had a few things to say about that. Gift. Yeah, it's brilliant. Karen sent an email. Please, Karen, quote them directly, please, because the line was fantastic. It's actually libel. If they mean us, it's libel. So I'm, you know, I'm. I'm well, I'll read the whole the whole email if you want. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I did have a rather acerbic reaction to it. Um, it says, "Greetings, Karen Stewart. Members of the militia, including me, were perplexed and troubled." by your advocacy of the militia confronting individuals searching property, seeking alleged, I didn't, I never told them to search property, um, seeking alleged direct energy weapons on the militia intelligence report on 5-19-17. I made it clear that any legitimate militia member would never advocate or behave in such an absurd, dangerous manner. We operate exclusively according to the law of the land, the Constitution for the United States. In addition, we wish to inquire why you propose informing the FBI about the crimes, um, war, terrorism on the American public that you specifically attribute to FBI-run fusion centers. And that I answered in my, in my reply. Overt Putin Russian government propaganda and the verification of informants known to me personally who are associates of yours are clear signs of counterintelligence operations. Militia members have publicly stated you are actively operating as agent, as you always have. Um, we wish to conduct our business in a lawful, straightforward, and above all, uh, honorable manner. Therefore, I put the following question directly to you, Karen Stewart. Are you still working on behalf of the U.S. government, NSA, or DHS, or FBI et al.? If you are not currently active in, actively engaged in espionage, why is it that you demonstrate every attribute of an agent provocateur? Agent provocateur, one, who, like I wouldn't know this, okay? One employed to associate with suspected persons and by pretending sympathy with their aims to incite them to some incriminating action, a person employed to encourage people to break the law so that they can be arrested. Um, it is essential. These issues are publicly and lawfully addressed. I think this is public, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it's public. but no, that's priceless uh, it's un okay and then my response to him unbelievably ridiculous no i was fired from nsa in late 2010 fought to get a partial retirement based on my 28 years of service which i began to receive in march 2011 the OPM agreed, agreed, sorry, NSA had tried to cheat me out of my retirement, so they fought with me. The OPM official's name in Boyers, Pennsylvania, where their office is, was Clyde Bronson. Ever hear of citizen's arrest? What you advocate doing to seditious officials? Is that legal or illegal? I'm sorry, I thought I was speaking to men, perhaps of the caliber of the founding fathers, but no. My, quick, my point is that the quickest way to prove that directed energy weapons are being used illegally is to confiscate one on the principles of citizen's arrest to show the world undeniable proof. Did I, de did I say to do so violently? No. I said a group could show up at a home or surround a car with one known to be powered by the engine and tell the perpetrator, we know you have an illegal directed energy weapon and we want you to turn it over to us to take the prop to the proper authorities or we will call them and demand they do, do it here and now and in doing so perhaps show, them, um, show the media as well. Now, who are the proper authorities? By law, it still is the FBI. Who else would you suggest? Give me another idea. Give me a viable idea. If a public display was made of turning over such a device, it would put the FBI in the position of having to do its job. Perhaps under new director Jeff Sessions, they would? The sections under 18 U.S. Code regarding weapons of mass destruction, domestic terrorism, and civilian penalties for participating in both or giving in assistance in regard to both can be invoked. Perhaps the publicity could shame the proper people, you know, the ones you somehow propose to arrest, 
By whom? Militia? Citizens arrest? Into doing their jobs? Ever look at the law regarding forcing feds to do their jobs? I will send you a letter to the FBI, which I just wrote and just sent to them to shame them into doing their jobs. It cites specific laws. I have been hit with dues 24-7 since late November 2015. That is 19 months straight. Many in my position and worse are desperate to have it stop before we are dead, capital letters. Some of this is radiological, capital letters. Directed energy weapons poison all the people around a target as well, not just family, but neighbors and even the fools using the weapons to get blowback. For all I know, I could have cancer right this moment. I have sudden vision damage, sudden heart ventricular damage, sudden appearance of a growth in the brain. I am sure I am paid a lot to allow NSA to do this to me as an agent, right? Is that your logic? So pardon my tone, but I am full uh, but I am in full overload dealing with an onslaught of absolute idiots recently. Feel free to unfriend me on all media. The women will continue this life or death fight as the men continue to whine and bloviate endlessly. Enjoy your beer and illusions of adequacy. Karen Stewart. <laughs> oh my God. That was a good end. <laughs> that was so one in the manly testicles, I would say, at the end. <laughs> getting better in time. <laughs> so hopefully we can find actual men in militias that have brains. So Yeah, and that have and brains. In the country, you know, I would like to say. We need to find the men. Where are the men? You know, I, I'm sure they're there somewhere. We need one is in Ecuador, them. but uh, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, well, I, I think that uh, this is, I knew that they would beg out of it. I knew that nobody's going to stand up for us and that they would get out of it somehow. I was surprised that they called you a Russian agent. Yes, and a and, spy. Uh, into yeah, yeah, apparently. Unbelievable. That's right out of it. Sorry. Go ahead, Kathy. I, I think this just shows this guy. I mean, I, I first, when I read his email, I thought, yep, I'm going to save his email as an example for my future, you know, YouTube videos of what exactly I mean by weaponized moron. Because that's precisely what. He's that's so, exactly right. He doesn't even know uh, who is on what side, even officially. Like, you, you, you accuse an ex NSA intelligence analyst to be a, an infiltrator. In the U.S. I mean, this is a U.S. intelligence agency. It's you where? I mean, you know, the yeah. NSA is not the KGB. That's right. What? You know, well, and I'm sorry, but if I were an infiltrator, would I say, hello, I'm from NSA? Right. But, you know, it's that tone of outrage that he adopted that makes me wonder who on earth he really is. Is this guy really standing for the militia or is he an infiltrator? Well, you know, he is in a top position, isn't he? If you listen, that's what they do. That's their MO. If you li he's a puppet on a string. He's got a hand up him. Yeah. He's a sock puppet for somebody. Because um, mm -hmm. when I spoke to him on the phone and before, he was perfectly nice. And then 24 hours after I spoke on the phone uh, to the militia, suddenly his attitude and his thinking changed as if he had been told by his handler, mm -hmm. oh, no. You know, this is not a cupcake. This is rat poison. Yeah. You know. Right, right. <laughs> so, well, and, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Karen. No, and he just automatically adopted it. So he's not particularly right. And when I spoke to him, I said, oh, "Okay, this probably doesn't have a lot of promise because he's not real bright." And Excellent. then his his email to me just proved it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but you know what? actually, we should follow this up. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm so itching to teach this guy a lesson. But he put in writing that because he said something like, "Oh, your associates are something like Russian infiltrators, and they are, are known known Russian personally. infiltrators." Um, yeah, who are your associates, Karen? I mean, is he is he yeah, possibly referring to us? I, no, well, he didn't say conveniently. But, but what he did say conveniently is that these people are known to him personally. So maybe <laughs> we should report him to the FBI because some Russian infiltrators are known to him personally. And maybe the FBI should know. This is true because it's against yeah. the law to know about felonies that are going on and not report them. 
exactly so why don't we just contact the fbi and you know let them open a file on this guy i mean he is interesting <laughs> let's face it and you know this whole this whole strategy of bringing russia into the mix why russia i mean is everybody going after russia <laughs> really amusing really amusing on the russian topic because there was the case of um, i'm not sure if you heard but when they um you know launched the iraq war they had to spin this story of weapons of mass destruction in iraq which is totally right. made up right yeah. and there was the what yeah. it's called like joint whatever of staff something something in the uk which had i think sir john scarlett on and sir richard dillard and they concocted this like dossier thing which turned out to be a total lie right and that's how they wrote the uk into the war but one of the things that happened after that is um that one of the top biological weapons um experts uh dr david kelly was died and I choose my words carefully because he died in a way that's actually absolutely impossible, right? Um, and it was um, claimed to be suicide. Now, the people who raised the alarm um, was a group of doctors and they said, you know, this is ridiculous. There's no way for a person to commit suicide like that. Even if they did that, it that way, there wasn't enough blood and it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, in other words, open brackets, you know, this was an MI5, you know, stage spectacle again. And there was lots of helicopters landing and taking off. And it was just nonsense from the start to end. But anyway, what happened is that these doctors started a genuine campaign and saying, we want a proper inquest. Because if people can be just bumped off, off like that, you know, when we don't live in a safe country, we want a proper inquest. And of course, the UK didn't grant it. And then they wanted to take it to the EU level. And the lead doctor who was campaigning for an inquest into the death, a proper inquest into the death of Dr. David Kelly was Dr. Stephen Frost, right? Now, what yeah. happened to Dr. Stephen Frost was as he was about to take it to the EU, something that to me personally looks strikingly like an MI5 takedown operation, you know, hammered down on him. And what happened is that he was um, sacked from his job as an army doctor um, on totally made up charges. They, they accused him of having done something, you know, on a job which he didn't start until two weeks later. And it just turned into a massive, you know, stupid thing. But um, so I attended his court case in last October in Manchester, which is when I was attacked by directed energy weapons mm -hmm. as an aside. But what was really interesting is that um, colonels in the UK army were trying to smear him as a Russian sympathizer by saying that his Facebook profile had an image of some scene in Russia. Maybe it was, you know, the whatever in um, Saint in the Red Square. Yeah, Saint Basel. Exactly. You know, the, the, the really iconic thing. And the thing about Dr. Stephen Frost is that he's an incredibly cultured man. He's really interested in classical music and opera and, and you know, the entire Russian, you know, cult literature and, and music. That's why he had a tongue. And they tried to smear him as a Russian sympathizer because of a photograph on his Facebook profile. And you read these, you know, the emails and the court case between these you know, Colonel saying, oh, yeah, very, very suspicious. You know, I mean, his Facebook profile. I'm like, is this really yeah. the standard of these military leaders? You know, is that how they found Anna Chapman, you know, in the US? It was like people like, ha ha, look at her Facebook profile. It has an image of Red Square, you know, and there are angry phone calls from the head of the FBI to the head of the NSA. It's like, this is your job to pick up these spies. It was her Facebook profile. It's digital. It's your job. <laughs> I mean, how stupid can these people yeah. be? Yeah, it's a total it's like setting up of a bogeyman. Yeah, oh, yeah, but it's like the dumbest possible way. I mean, it's just it's just breathtaking, you know. Anyway, it is it's, it's transparently well, uh, transparently stupid, you know, and oh, and yeah, that's yeah. what astonishes me so incredibly that about them, hit, you know, calling um, Karen as well a Russian yeah. spy. I mean. I studied Russian. Do they want to call me a Russian spy as well? Once upon a time, I've mostly <laughs> forgotten it. I really love it. No, no, it's you. You're the one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you personal acquaintance of this militia man? I'm the sleeping Russian spy, no doubt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well you know, I think it, it may be whoever saw Dr. Shivago probably is on their list. <laughs> right. right. Or, read, or ever read mean. War and Peace. David Grandma right, Ramola's transcript. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think we should take this thing much further because first of all, it's exposing frauds. And second of all, it's really good for laughs. I think what we should do is there's militias and oath keepers all over the U.S. We're glad you're... Oh! <laughs> Can't the, Russian on, the Russians pooped in the hallway. That's yeah. great. It's two, two dogs. And the meme is, we're glad you're home. The Russians pooped in the hallway. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. But here's what I'd like to encourage. Since there are these, this is the Maryland, Virginia militia, right? That's what he claims. Okay. Well, there's militias which are set in place to, to protect American citizens from the government, government encroachments. And of course, they're encroaching on the Fourth Amendment, which protects us from illegal search and seizures, and of course, being hit by energy weapons, I think would, would agree with that. But they're marching around. Now, I can understand not wanting to go up against the deep state. Believe me, it's a scary thing. Uh, they control all the governments, they control all the media, and it's, it's scary to have enough balls to get up and actually do something. And I don't expect any of these militias or oath keepers to do anything. I expect them all to beg out exactly like Karen's did. And so here's what I'd like to encourage all the people who listen to this video and the people that are in the chat today. Find out where your oath keeper or your local militia is and write them a nice letter telling them that you're being hit by energy weapons or there are people around you that are being hit by energy weapons and that you would like them to intervene on your behalf, on behalf of the Constitution, and uh, do it's something, so stand up. And then after you write, send, and you get the response, send it to us. We'll put it together in a video with some funny background music, and we'll read it up. Honestly, if you're a member of one of these groups and you attend a meeting, you have to realize that it's a fraud. Unless you do something about this, you have to realize that uh, it's not just a fraud, but you're paying dues to a fraud. And if we can find one of these things that isn't a fraud and is actually going to do something, I'll be the first one to stand up and applaud it. I'll make a video about it. We'll, we'll, we'll praise them all over the place. But I would bet you that we're going to get, no matter how many articles you guys send out, all of you people that are listening to this, uh, will get that many refusals back. I'd be very, very surprised if they do anything, because they're not—they're there to—they're there to beat their chests and say they're going to do something. But when push comes to shove, oh, by the way, did, I heard this morning that uh, Theresa May wants a crackdown because of the Manchester bombing in England, oh, and the my. police. The police are refusing to do it. The police are Great. pushing back. Yeah, Say it so. again, because for me it broke, um, the audio broke up because you said something really relevant here for Europe. So, you know, the European end of the connection broke okay. up. What did Theresa May say? Theresa May, of course, wants to impose martial law. They're waiting for something so they can impose martial law. In this, uh, what's her name, Adrienne Grand concert where they had these jihadis who actually were known to the UK government the whole time. They were following them. The parents of the jihadis even warned the government, this guy is dangerous, our son is dangerous. But they didn't do anything, it blows up. So there's the reason for martial law. So Theresa Way, Murray wants to uh, initiate martial law and have them crack down uh, you know, troops in the streets or police in the streets, and the police are saying, yeah, maybe we don't want to do that. So we'll have to see how that turns out. But That's it huge. sounds like it's huge. That's fantastic, so, actually. You know what? The one thing is because, sorry, it, in, in, in all the false flags, I lost track. Um, <laughs> all of us, really. How many, you know, all the time? Yeah, I, 
Absolutely. So, you know, the last false flag I heard about was this like really iconic one. We have to get Big Ben in. So that was the one right next to Parliament. You know, um, the one thing is, I, were you referring to a new false flag in a concert hall or something? Or did yeah, I miss it? Yeah, there was. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Karen, you want to tell her about it? Oh, no, just uh, it, one just happened in um, Manchester. Yes, Manchester. Oh, when was uh, there was that? A Sorry, I was so busy. At a concert. Last week. I, just, ah, God, I have to look it up. I mean, yeah. You know, I, I just. Post, I post on a blog, so I'm aware of all this stuff. And, yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps if they quit issuing the jihad visas, <laughs> oh, you boy. know, this might uh, help. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're here for jihad? Just step this way. <laughs> it's like you know what i mean if you ever travel from from continental europe into london the first thing you notice is i mean everywhere they've got these iconic blue uk border plc signs right no plc just says uk border like that's uniform and what's also uniform is the massive queue you'll be standing in and if your if your passport is chipped right so it can be remote you know followed everywhere you can go through the fast queue and then have your face scanned you know at these automatic maybe they should have a third line the extra fast line of you know false flag jihad now you know <laughs> express line into london just carry a flag and you you do it. exactly you know, I, you right. know ice and al qaeda <laughs> I so lost track. I remember, Karen, uh, the other day we were talking about some false flag and I falsely, I said to you, oh, yes, it happened next to um, the MI6 building. I mean, back then the London thing hadn't happened because the thing under Big Ben is now walking distance from MI6, right? So the kiddies from MI5 and MI6 didn't have that far to go. But I, then I figured out why I, I, I thought the previous false flag I was referring to, I assumed it was next to the MI6 building because, um, and that was the, I think it was, what was his name? Lee Rigby, when they de supposedly decapitated the soldier. And it's like, oh my God. I mean, well, you know, just watch the video footage and spot the, you know, bullshit. But I was thinking, why did I tell Karen it was next to the MI6 building? Because it wasn't, it was next to some barracks. And then I remembered, I read the article and I think it was the sun or something online. And then there it says, you know, as if that bit of information was important, you know, ostensibly. Oh, yes, the, um, you know, the person who did this arrived in a, in a Vauxhall uh, Tigra. And that's the key, right? Because they put it into all these articles. A Vauxhall Tiger, if you, if you uh, reverse it. And Vauxhall Cross is where the MI6 building is. That's the station. So when I, you know, read through this, you know, the, the report of the false flag, I'm like, Vauxhall Tiger. Okay. Yeah. He was carried there by a Vauxhall Tiger, was he? You know? I mean, come on. So anyway, but if you actually look at the footage of that false flag, it's quite impressive because there's, I think, one on one of the um, tabloids, an actual video footage where they, I think, take out the police um, shoots one of the guys. And it's like, it's really well done because you have like the, the machine gun or the, the uh, you know, the automatic um, guns going tick, tick, tick. And then one just goes, Poof, and that's the, the echo is the sniper rifle. You can say, it's wow. They, you know, it's like Hollywood standard now, these false yeah. flags. It's amazing, you know, it, they have it all. But then when you look at the details, it's just so much bollocks. I mean, God, sorry. I'm, I get so angry. I'm, I'm particularly angry this week about, you know, UK because I got a reply. But, you know, now that we're talking about letters, I finally got a reply from Greater Manchester Police because, as I said, when I visited that court case, I was massively assaulted with microwave weapons in my hotel room at night. Like half my head was burned, you know? Try going to a court case and, you know, think straight when your head was just cooked. So in the evening, I went to the police and I tried to make a police report. And they didn't allow me to talk to police officers, send me back to my hotel. And then... And they sent a mental health ambulance two and a half later, two and a half hours later. So I was like, okay. And this whole thing is online. And then I, you know, went back. And in December, I said, okay, that was very nice. Now, please send me my crime report. And they refused. They just didn't send it to me for months on end. So I asked a second time. I'm like, please, could you please send me my crime report? And, and also, I put in a bunch of questions like, who exactly authorized this? You know, who decided to call a mental health ambulance, given that I didn't even speak to a police officer? 
Who was that? You know, second, who sent the ambulance again? Which ambulance force was it? Because one guy looked a bit like an actor, frankly, you know, uh, who exactly are the people who appear in my video? You know, who were the police officers at the scene? Because I would love to talk to them again. You know, all these questions. And also I put in a question like, could it be, or, you know, was there any phone call from say MI5 or some such external organization to put requesting this? So what do Very I get? I get back a letter saying, you know, from Greater Manchester saying, oh, you know, I think it was, I think, Inspector Miskell or Miskell or however to pronounce his surname. And he said, I think um, your answers are best dealt with in a phone call, you know, and please call me. These are my shifts. And then he lifts it, lists his shifts for May and June. And, you know, all very nice letter. So I showed this letter to Melanie, uh, Richan, you know, another team member. And she says, oh, be careful with that because I had exactly the same thing when I reported it to police. They call you in or, you know, she was called into the police station or they ask you for a phone call. And then the first question is, are you seeing somebody about your mental health? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. I was about to write back a really nice, you know, letter to this police officer saying, "Yeah, sure, I will call you." And I was like, "Fuck that!" You know, have I lost my mind? You know, I'm like, no. So I wrote back a really stern letter saying, "Dear Inspector Miskell, I, you know." Thank you for your letter, but I beg to differ about your assessment. I think my, you know, issues are best dealt with you, with you issuing me my crime report and replying to my questions. You're sincerely. I love it. Can't All right. right, you did. Can't that is the right thing to do. But you really do need to go go there and get a copy of the of the call log or the report and make sure that they did not put in your file that you are that you are a mentally ill person because I had a lawyer actually wrote and, and he was a, um, Oh gosh, what do you call him? He was a, the public lawyer and I can't even think of the name for it, but he actually a public the prosecutor. No. Um, district attorney, public prosecutor, uh, public uh, defender. Eight, 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 eight. Okay. Attorney general. No, <laughs> it's eight. Oh gosh. Legal aid, legal, legal aid, aid, legal aid. Legal aid. By the way, let me just weigh into my eyes. Y'all see that my left eye is. <laughs> oh. See, Gosh, my brain is things. really yeah. under. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. under attack. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so. The lawyer from Legal Aid uh, actually wrote the police department in Mount Pleasant and told them they had to redact that from my file. And that but the reason is when they put that in your file that you're mentally ill, then the police department. The police officers can come to you and approach you as a, a dangerous person. And you could get shot on a humble. Seriously. So you want to go get a copy of what they've got in your file and make sure they don't have in there that you're mentally ill and then get a lawyer to write and make them redact it. They've got to take that out. That's what the lawyer said is that's their opinion. And their opinion could cost you your life. Wow. Thank uh, you. Yeah, wow. that's very important information. Plus, these jerks, a lot of them are high school graduates, and they will uh, basically say, in my opinion, or I don't think so, I think this or that psychologist or psychologist or, or psychiatrist is wrong. <laughs> really, you with your high school education have assessed that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, but you, you know have to be careful. Yes, you do have to be careful, and that's what I wanted to, to weigh in on as well, because as Melanie said, Catherine, you know, what they're trying to do is in some way get you, you know, they're kind of out to get you despite what you're doing. You know, you're calling, you're, you're, you're writing a letter to them and saying you want it in writing, you want the crime report, you know, you want the document, you want the record. And they've got the goal to say you, you have to call us. And Melanie's kind of broken that code for you and told you what that's all about, right? They want, they want you to call them so that they can completely link you to mental health issues. And, you know, that ultimately, this is a huge, huge deal. And I wrote about it in, in uh, Millicent's article last night, actually. And that's something that we were talking about last night. Remember, Millicent? This yeah. whole issue of police, the police and psychiatry, it's a huge issue. And we have got to break it open. We've got to break it down. And we've got to expose it, you know, from every front because they are holding this against the populace. And they are, they are building, and you know, we are talking about the same contingents, contingent, the guys who are running the false flags are the same ones who are building the fake laws, right? And putting the laws in the books saying, 
or we can step in and do community mental health interventions at any time. We can walk into your house if you, if you call us and we decide that we are going to label you a mentally ill person. I mean, Millicent has had two, two occasions where they have literally walked into a house. Right, Millicent? Wow. And she, Millicent is incredibly savvy and has fought back. But, um, and, you know, we should go into detail really on both those occasions in just a minute. Um, this is a great segue. <laughs> great. Then, then, then we should talk about it. Because if you hear about her situation, Catherine, I think you'll understand exactly how the police are stepping in and using the scenario with psychiatry against people. Um, so maybe, Melissa, you should just talk about that very first occasion in particular, and we can go into the second after that. You know what, before Melissa, because I want, I want to, this entire episode to be actually about Melissa's case, I just want to add briefly that um, I think this is really, really important, and I think people should learn with us, you know, we're stepping through the system and we're uncovering it. And people should watch what we're doing and imitate, you know. It doesn't mean you can't go to the police. When I went to the court, the judges said, oh, have you talked to the police? You know, and I said, well, no, because they're totally incompetent. I mean, if I don't understand this technology, but some guy with a high school degree is not gonna. So, you know, the judge was fine with that. But you do need to at least somehow get a toehold to, to, to prove that the police is incompetent. You know, but I think it doesn't mean that we can't go to the police, but it means that if you go to the police, you have to be prepared that you're not actually going to police officers, you're going to criminals, right? And you're there to get them. So Inspector Misko, I'm out to get you, you know, watching you, <laughs> watching you, watching me. Catherine, Catherine, you cannot do that. Listen, I'm a mental health professional. Paul, you got to help me here. She can't make threats. Seriously, seriously, you can't do that, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? We should, what we will have, and I think these people are not prepared for that because they still don't understand the internet and network mathematics. Because what we're actually doing here is we are compiling case files on them. But unlike the FBI case, case files, ours will be public. So, for example, the two colonels who tried to smear Dr. Stephen Frost have been published by the Daily Mail in the UK. And anybody typing Dr. Stephen Frost and searching for the court case in October can find their way, can find these people and track them down on LinkedIn and track them forever, right? Because these corrupt guys, they're going to migrate through the system. So any bullshit from Inspector Misko, and we'll make sure that his name will be on the internet forever. And wherever he crops up as chief commissioner or whatever, wherever the hell these people are promoted, you know, the internet and the public will remind him that he screwed up so badly when it was a question of solving crimes against humanity, you know. And this is how we're going to get them. It's all about network mathematics. And actually, right now, we are already benefiting from this because within seconds, a teenager can pull information from the internet about these criminals that before, just 20 years ago, would have taken a serious FBI investigation. You know, that's the truth. And, and I think there's also a huge amount of power in actually calling out these crimes. We're actually seeing crime and criminality within police departments. And you know, right now in the US, I don't know the exact details because I didn't have much time the last few days to read these articles, but there's some move, maybe Karen can address this, there's some move afoot um, to, what is it called, the Blue Light Project or something like that to protect our police? Uh, this I'll have to uh, yeah I'll have to read about it I haven't yet so I can't speak to it. Okay, there's some bill on the books and someone was sending out a petition and I just put that on Twitter, but I was thinking, oh, I have to go back and look at that in greater detail. But it was literally about, you know, in a sense, trying to, there, there's a tussle between civil rights on the one hand and police on the other. You know, it's like, do we roll back our civil rights in order to protect our police? I don't think so. You know, I think um, the police is supposed to fulfill a certain societal uh, function, correct, of protecting the people. And if they are not protecting people, then they should be called out for it. But now it seems that there is a push to protect the police more and more. In yeah. other words, you know, yeah, actually, solidify you know the police a bit more. 
Yeah, that is is a, it actually it occurs naturally. It's not surprising because it's a it's a natural um you know it's a natural system effect because the people are in there. They've got cushy positions. They've got cushy pensions. And once you're inside, what you want to do is make your job easier. So it, it's a natural system effect that with time, the police would rather not go after really serious criminals who can literally, you know, pop caps into their asses because that's kind of uncomfortable. So what they would rather do is go after you, Ramola, when you take your daughter to school, you know. Because oh, they're doing it. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. why they're taking, you've got these big, you know, big, strong men, police officers getting into a freaking chopper to follow you that you take your daughter to school and back. Well, what we have is one big fat financial liability up in the chopper who's not doing his job, you know, because for every hour that chopper is up in the air following you. I mean, I'm really glad that they, are, they do follow you, Ramola, because you're one of the systemically most important people right now, along with the other members of my team. So I'm jolly glad that Massachusetts, you know, choppers are used to protect you. However, it is a bit of a financial burden on the oh, they've got their and the police cars, you know, like I should tell you the last few days, because we've been talking, Millicent and I have been especially talking about the police issue and the police and psychiatric issue. And every time we have a conversation immediately afterward, I have a police car waiting for me as I'm trying to leave my neighborhood to go pick up my daughter, you know, from school in the afternoon and a police cars on the street this morning, you know, like fire engines racing in front of me, racing on the right hand side of me. <laughs> police cars turning, you know, with their sirens blaring right across. And, you know, and, and, and this is plausible deniability, right? Of course, because I'm sure the police have important things to do and there's a fire somewhere. But if this happens every single day on every single outing, you know, you know then you have to ask questions you know about it. You know what? I mean, you, you told me about this before, but you know what my gut feeling is that given that you sent this memo to Trump, he literally said, listen, if something happened to this girl, Right? <laughs> I'll look so bad. So you guys make sure the roads are clear oh. in front of her, right? That's why you've got, you know, the police <laughs> front of it behind you, you know? Right. I, I'm the Sikh and the sleeping dignitary, apparently. <laughs> right. I'm definitely getting a lot of attention. And, you know, it really kind of blows my mind as to why, because all I'm doing is um, exposing crime. Well, First Amendment. Amendment. <laughs> First Amendment. <laughs> I think it's important that we redefine exactly. or look at police in a whole different way. They're not there to protect you. They're there. All they do is enforce law. I always looked at, at them and the military as the government's organs of violence. Yes. Governments couldn't exist without these criminals uh, inflicting their rules and their, their taxes and everything on you. They play the role of the organs of violence. Uh, they kill people on behalf of, mm -hmm. they kill them or cage them on behalf of the government. And yes, and the, deep state. and the deep state. Uh, yeah. We do have a comment in the, uh, in the chat here that it sounds like Mel Millicent isn't getting her uh, time <laughs> on the air and we've been... We've been kind of <laughs> oh, going. that's very, very so, true, my goodness. Millicent, yes, it's I'm funny. sorry that we seem to run over you. We don't mean to. No, no, no. Actually, <laughs> we, 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 Millicent, we'll get on, get on to Millicent um, immediately because her case is actually at the core of this. It's the biggest, most bombshell case. Just before my last sentence on the police issue is also that what you described, Paul, is the situation with the police. And, and actually, Millicent has tons of stories about this, which we need to analyze carefully. Um, the, the thing with the police is that what you described is a police in deep capture. And that's it. it. This is what the police is like when a system is in deep capture. This isn't normal because I've also experienced yeah. police, which generally is there to help you. But when you're actually inside the police and you experience this, what you, the way you can tell that you are in deep capture is you will get a lot of bullshit from above. You know, and maybe next to you because, you know, also deep capture goes to, to your colleagues and sometimes under you, so it engulfs you, you know. Um, and um, one thing I want to say is that I have met really a lot of police officers who are, I mean, not just dedicated, they are willing and some of them have given their life. And they have to understand that what we're now doing is actually recapture. So we're putting pressure on them from below, from the, you know, the, the, the people who they are actually serving, you know, because the people 
also get the top and they should be their servants so that they can pass the pressure on to their superiors to crush the real criminals there, you know? So what I really want with Inspector Misko is that he stops pissing me around and actually, you know, frees the way that I can go after the people who made the phone call, you know, who corrupted this guy? Is it in the protocol to have a section? If so, I want to find out who wrote that protocol or did someone make a phone call? That's what we're after. You know, of course he can't give it now, but he will sooner or later through the court case, you know, because that's where we're moving. So anyway, now let's open the floor because in Millicent's case is a bombshell, the total bombshell. It is. And I'm so sorry that it's taken me so long and that I just published the article be because really none of you have had a chance to read the article, right, um, at this point. But it's going to be online for a long time. And Millicent and I have been working on this article together literally for, I think, four months, right, Millicent? And I think Millicent was beginning to lose faith in my ability to write the story. Uh, <laughs> but, but, we, but we've pulled it off. <laughs> Well, I, you know, it, it has to be born. In, in, sorry. <laughs> I knew you could do it. I was just having increased torture from the oh. perpetrator who was trying to make me stop working with you and telling me that he was controlling you and just all kinds of, of, of uh, interference from him as a result of it. You all have to know that I have received increased, severely increased damage to my right leg because of his anger. I'm so sorry, Millicent. And that's one of the reasons why I was getting a little frantic. I thought we really have to get the story out there. We really have to finish no, I it. You know, and because uh, you had started to tell us that he's actually keeping tabs. Well, you know, everything's surveilled. My computer's surveilled. I even started to save my stuff on Google Docs at night because I've lost drafts before. And just to yeah. save the text every night, I've been putting it on Google Docs. So, yeah, everybody and their grandmother is reading that story as it's, you know, being written over the last four months. And um, so I guess, you know, it's understandable that this guy has also read my story. And he's aware of what's the amount of exposure and disclosure in the article is mind-boggling because it comes directly from Millicent's affidavits, complained to various uh, state and um, Senate representatives, her um, letters to, to various people, her letters to, the, uh, to physicians for human rights, um, letters to congressmen and women, um, Right, and so so many so many sources I had to look at to pull together the information for this article, um, and you know the 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 one time that I did try to contact, um, I get who I who I thought was Mount Pleasant Police, but who was actually Columbia Police, right? Um, wow. He he did not get back to me, um, and that particular incident. Um, I can say very briefly, I was calling him trying to find out what the significance is of a certain code that was yeah. recorded in Millicent's 911 logs. And I should say that Millicent, over the last, I don't know how many years precisely, Millicent, because you've been calling that 911 number for a long time to record sleep deprivation. Was, 2011 was when I started. 2011. And since then, you've been pretty consistent, right, calling that number? Just re to record sleep deprivation and assaults in the middle of the night with our f frequencies right. and transmissions right. and implant activations all through right. your body. And um, every time you called, um, it was recorded as nothing very extraordinary. And very often on several occasions, it was recorded as the calls of an insane person. 1096, right, was the code over there. And so the codes that they use, you can actually go online, pray for the internet, um, go online and find the Tennessee radio signals and codes. And you can look at this table and match the codes they've got on the logs and see, aha, so this is what that means. It means call back up, call another officer, traffic light out or something like that, you know, whatever the codes are. And you can match the two. And they had a couple codes on there that I did not understand. One was uh, 1041 for civil defense test. And I think one was 1096, request test count. So Millicent and I put our heads together and, and wondered what that was about. And we initially thought it might be civil defense siren test, which is apparently a code. 
and, or rather it's apparently a thing, not a code. And it has to do with, you know, these air raid sirens during World War II, because there were physical sirens in every city and county and town. Um, but somehow this didn't quite sound like that, right, Millicent? It didn't, I mean, we don't have, we're supposedly not in the middle of a war. I mean, you and I know we are in the middle of a war. This is asymmetric warfare, it's stealth warfare, it's radiation warfare, it's surveillance yeah. warfare. You know what's, what's really interesting, actually, because um, one of the things that's important to note is that the air ray test is um, automatically tied up with um, actual, um, well, what's it called? It's, um, it's, it's not air traffic control, it's basically um, air surveillance because um, the air sirens are to warn you of planes coming in. So it's, it's intimately tied to air traffic control. And as we discussed earlier in the week when we were talking about, you know, satellites and, and implants and how are implants connected to satellites, you know, Yura Mola made the point that the earliest implants were when again in the 1950s or 60s? Days. I think 68 or 69, yeah. Yeah, so in the 1960s, they already had implants, and these implants were in agents, and they would have wanted to track the agents globally, right, because these were, you know, that was the entire point. Um, and now the system that was in place back in the 1960s that had global coverage was air traffic control, you know, this, this sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So the, the steering and control of implants is intimately, in my view, intimately tied mm -hmm. to air traffic control, you know, to add anything to do with, you know, flights or, um, you know, and later on that was, I think, um, upgraded to satellite systems and so on as the system um, went up. So I'm, and, and again, you know, the, the, the person who is torturing militants is associated with the Air Force again. So we have these links, you know, and air raid sirens are again to warn off, you know, um, enemy jets approaching, you know. So this is all seems to be linked. So whatever is torturing Millicent and these implants seem to be piggybacking on that system, I would say. So maybe that's, that's where to look for this information. But I mean, this is the amount of research you two have done is mind boggling. And I just want people to understand that the article that Ramola has written and that, you know, the, the, well, the actual forensic uh, investigation that Millicent as a victim had to do herself is amazing. It's, it's like the most mind-blowing thing you're going to read. I mean, this is the most prize-winning investigative journalism you'll find this decade. You know, be aware and, and, you know, read the article like that. And also be aware that the research that Millicent has done is just, I mean, in my view, better than, you know, the entire FBI department would have done on this topic. It's, it it's is, it is. Well, I think maybe we should also say that uh, Millicent's case is so incredibly unique because she knows her torturer. I mean, and he is the yeah. one who is implementing it personally. I mean, with, with me, you know, Bill Black Jr. put me on the list to get electronic harassment, but he's not doing it himself. He just ordered it. This person, and, and very few people have a personal torturer like Millicent does. He's basically taken his torturing of her and turned it into a contract that allows mm -hmm. him to torture her personally day in, mm -hmm. day out uh, for money. So with yes. that, we need to, you know, I think we needed to explain uh, the uniqueness of her case and then, you know, take it from there. And, and also, yeah. it's, a, more like, it's also a federal contract, isn't it? It is. It is. And this is, this is exactly what we need to do. I think very briefly, we want to encapsulate what exactly is going on with Millicent, you know, kind of just give a little bit of an introduction to, to her whole scenario and situation. And uh, Millicent, I can try to quickly run through it. And if I'm getting too, uh, too long, just stop me, anybody, you know, and cut to the chase. <clears throat> but basically, I think this all started with, Mil with, uh, with Millicent having something of um, an involvement with a young man many years ago, way back in time, in the, in the 80s, between 1981 and 1988, when this guy was just getting ready to join the Air Force, right? And yeah. she was just getting, getting through a divorce. She was in the middle of getting through a divorce. And in fact, her friends later told her, you would never have gotten involved with this guy if you hadn't been in the middle of getting through a divorce. Um, because she'd heard things about him and she wasn't really certain that she should get involved with him, which turned out to be problematic later, of course. <clears throat> so then um, 
the brief encounters that she had with him before he left for the Air Force culminated somewhat when he came back from a six-year stint, which appeared somewhat mysterious. There was no indication at that time as to what he was doing during that time. But later on, Millicent, with her brilliant sleuthing skills, did find out what he'd been doing at that time. He was um, out uh, probably in Washington State at that time getting, uh, doing a SEER training, right, Millicent? Right. Among other um, uh, among other things, and SEER training is survival, evasion, resistance, escape training, which all airmen are put through. And SEER training is also torture and enhanced interrogation training, which is the kind that the two, uh, which is the training rather, that those two psychologists, uh, Mitchell and Jensen, the guys were paid $81 million by the CIA to go torture people at Abu Ghraib um, and Guantanamo, right? Um, that's where they came from. They came from the Air Force, those two psychologists. They came from their expertise in establishing torture through the SEER system for, for airmen. And, um, and you know the connection there with the CIA. So then they go and work for the CIA. So this is what he'd been training in. So this guy is trained, and this is a very key aspect of this entire story with Millicent, um, the persecution of Millicent, is that the, the, guy, the man who is torturing her is actually very well versed in torture techniques that are actually taught and by the U.S. Air Force and that people in the Air Force are put through. And the point of the seer, of course, is that ostensibly to help airmen evade um, giving away secrets or evade, you know, if they're captured in enemy territory and if they are tortured in these many ways. And if they are interrogated in these many ways, you know, with sleep deprivation, with sensory de deprivation, with excessive fatigue, uh, with um, extremes of hot and cold, with waterboarding. Mm -hmm. Sexual humiliation. Sexual humiliation and so forth. I mean, how are they supposed to respond? So they're supposed to respond by standing up as, um, you know, strong American soldiers and airmen and refusing to give away state secrets and so forth. Right, so, so that's the intention and the intent of the SEER torture training. So <clears throat> apparently they're all put through it. So, and you can actually go online and you can find various sites where a lot of guys who've gone through this training express their opinions about it. And there are a few articles written about it, you know, um, and there's mixed opinions. Some of them say, oh, you know, I'm so glad I went through it. It's taught me so much. And uh, many of them say this is, Absolute BS. It's just total torture, and it should not be done. Should not be done by the Air Force, you know. So you have both opinions out there. You no, know, just sorry to interject because I, I think this is already. I mean, you know, every sentence of what you're saying is, I think, enough for a PhD thesis here. But I think I want people to understand that what you've just described. You know, the two people who got what was it again? Eighty-one million to go out and torture people. Right? In Guantanamo was it or in Abu Ghraib? And sorry, it was Ab it was Abu Ghraib, I believe. Abu Ghraib, okay, sorry, but you know, I, I missed that. So uh, we know what happened at Abu Ghraib, right? Now the other thing to keep in mind is that it, I don't care how many people were in Abu Ghraib, but the people who were in there, but what the hell could they have done against US national security when you've got a steamrolling army and, you know, planes and warships and, you know, trillions of dollars of equipment, like a handful of guys? What is that? It's not national security what was done at Abu Ghraib or even at Guantanamo. What no, it actually is, yeah. is, and I want people to have this image in mind, it is a psychopath's playground. There is no, there is no national security function in this bullshit. You know, it is a psychopath playground. So the two guys who were given eighty-one million are totally mentally ill people. They are and they're damaged. psychologists. They are psychologists, and you see, that's the ultimate irony here. You've got psychologists. You've got trained psychologists. What is a psychologist? I mean, think about it. Who is a psychologist? You know, what is a psychologist well, supposed to do? I'll tell you. The Torture is never, ever, for gleaning information from combatants or detainees. That's never the purpose. There was, I, got, I just, wrote, I just uh, downloaded an article 
by a Jesuit who wrote uh, an article 400 years ago saying, you don't get information. They'll tell you anything you want to know. All you have to do is torture them. And some of them pride, oh, I've told them a lot of stuff, but it's nothing's true. But it's for uh, uh, getting confessions to already existing narratives. Uh, that's what they've done in Guantanamo. They've done it all over. They did it for World War II. They said, oh, yeah, we killed them in the, in the, in the whatever they killed them. They, that's one thing it's good for. Uh, what they're using Guantanamo for is to see how much these people can take. And I think that's what they were doing in Abu Ghraib. Also, oh you have to realize that uh, this, these are all controlled by Satanists who have... Um, yeah. uh, when They have a thing about torture. They have a thing about blood sacrifice and bloodletting. They do. Yeah. When, when Bush set up uh, Guantanamo, he insisted that the people that ran Guantanamo reported to Rumsfeld, who's also a Satanist, every day on how it's going. And then he, of course, reported to Bush. So it's, it's a closed system designed to see what people can take and also get this negative fear energy circulating mm -hmm. So that's that's besides the torture that you guys are going through, which is for a whole different world together. But I want everybody to get out of their mind that torture has anything to do with getting information. That's been disproven hundreds of years ago, and it's been disproven by Senate committees now. It mm -hmm. doesn't happen. You don't get information that way. It's yes, for other purposes. That's very interesting, Paul. I'm, that's you know I've always wanted. But why on earth is Guantanamo still being kept open? Why, what, why are they torturing people in there? You know, why are they detaining people in there? It doesn't make any sense in terms of, you know, is it symbolic? Is it a metaphor? Is, the, is it a precedent? What are they doing? But, you know, it, it doesn't make sense by normal. I, you know what? I, I, I have got a, a theory about that. And it will tie in with uh, Millicent's case and with our cases as well. And uh, my suspicion, when you look at exactly the details, right, I mean, if you look at what we know about Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, you will see certain features recurring that go to the heart of the matter. And they will be a reflection of the perpetrators. And what you will see in all these cases is the sexual violence. Do you remember the photographs with the, you know, the guys naked on this um, box and so on with a hood over his head, you know, throwing water over naked people? The nakedness, this is, what this is, it absolutely no function in terms of national security. What this is, it is porn for the perpetrators because the perpetrators are psychopaths and for them, it is literally sexual arousal. The combination of violence, torture, mutilation in a sexual setting is for them addictive. So what Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib actually were, were porn factories. They were porn factories. And I bet my guts that it was filmed and it was sent back and sold on as prime footage. I think this is what it is. And the reason why it ties in with all the torture of all the, um, you know, the targeted people, the victims of the intelligence agencies, is because I know for a fact that everything I do in my home is filmed because they echoed stuff back to me, right? It, and, and the actual, the, the nakedness and the sexual element is there throughout. It has no function no function in terms of surveillance or national security. So we are human trafficked. You know, as, as mm -hmm. Millicent pointed out, she was told, and then I want her to say it again in this episode, that there's a, a porn market for the mutilation and maiming of women in their 60s. Right, Millicent? Right. And Catherine, you know, for myself, if you can imagine what it's like every single day you take a bath or a shower, you have one specific familiar voice talking to you about how you bathe, what his wife does while she bathes, uh, you forgot a place or you forgot a spot and realize that you're being recorded and other men are having this as their sexual, as their oh breakfast for the morning. I've, I have dealt with this every single day since 2008, every single day. I don't, I don't ever go into the bathroom for my bath 
without having that person. And it's only one, one voice, and that's what's so ugly about it for me, is that familiar person talking in such specific real-time mm -hmm. uh, communication. And some of those women that we're talking about don't even bathe or don't like to bathe, or they bathe in the dark so that they won't feel like they're being violated. Mm -hmm. You know what, I can back up everything that you say, because when I visited Melanie Richan in Brussels, where I was attacked by Belgian intelligence that followed me around with their hum intel network, they waited and after the first evening when I was working with her, that I went back to the hotel, climbed into the shower when I was naked, that's when they shot me in the face through the window, right, nakedness. Then when they, they had a habit of every, I think I've got chips in my arm and, and they had this habit of vibrating my arm into paralysis so that I would you know collapse on the um, floor from pain. They would do that daily when I climbed into my shower. And another thing where, again, we're tying in with all the other uh, people who have been attacked, look carefully at the case of Bill Binney and Kirk Weeby. When I heard an interview by Kirk Wiebe, he explained how um, um, several of the NSA whistleblowers who were working together had a raid on their home simultaneously. Now, Kirk Wiebe at the time was sitting at his computer and he could see people come up his drive and he rushed down to open the door before they, you know, blow off his front door. But what he didn't know, the story that Bill had at the same time was that he climbed into the shower and these mm. goons dragged him out of the shower. Now mm. this is, this in terms of forensic evidence is worth gold because immediately when it's a simultaneous raid and one person is naked, look at the person who's naked. He was the technical leader of the NSA. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was naked and they wanted to humiliate him by dragging him out of the shower naked. Right? Again, the sexual element. Again, it's there. And one of the things you can tell immediately is that the entire raid was entirely timed on the moment Bill Binney climbed into the shower. Because the most important thing was that he was the leader and whoever, you know, he pissed off with his intellect wanted to humiliate him. That's what it was about. Let me, let me confirm what you said. One of the things that Randy Webster said, oh, there he goes, but now I want y'all to I want y'all to see my eyes. <laughs> Can yeah. you tell that my brain is under attack? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's okay, by us. One of the things that that I was told in 2008 is that they like the element of surprise, and so seven o'clock in the morning is their favorite time to come to a person's house. And seven o'clock in the morning on August the 16th, I believe, 2011, was when a police officer came to my home, told me he had a warrant to take me to the hospital, and he had an ambulance with him. With the, It was the police sergeant, his lieutenant, and an officer. All three of them came in my home un uninvited. The officer refused to let me see what he called a warrant to take me to the hospital. I said, well, which judge signed it? He mm -hmm. said, um, well, he called one judge's name, but when I finally did see the document, it did not have that judge's name on it. It was another judge and it had not been hand signed. It was just his name typed on the form. The person who signed that, what he called detaining a warrant was the sergeant himself. Um, so Very obviously I wasn't dressed. Obviously I wasn't dressed. And he was gonna make me leave the house undressed I just happened to have kept a um, blue jean dress that buttons up the front. I kept that where I could always put it around on me because I never wanted to go to the door undressed. If I had not put that dress on, he would have made me leave the house in my gown because he wouldn't let me put my shoes on. I had to wear house shoes. And they threatened to arrest me if I didn't go with them. Now, I'm in my house, minding my own business. I might have called to make a complaint during the night, but this was at 7 o'clock in the morning, exactly the time that that person who I've talked to you all about before told me that that's when they like to surprise the victim. Um, the other thing about that particular morning was the... <laughs> That time and the second time that that sergeant came to my house, his name was Jeffrey Taylor. He had made a statement to me, say, a week or two prior. 
And when he came to my house with his warrant, the statement he had made to me was what was on the warrant. And he said, I said it. When I looked yes. up. And, and that me, had to do with the satellites, right? He actually said to you, they, they put satellites around the victims, around targets. And then later. The he, oh, that's the second time. Yeah. So there's, the there's first, several remarks that he's made. Right. The first time it was about microchips. Remember, and, and him yes, saying yes, that's on that particular issue. warrant that he had uh, observed evidence that made him think that I had been mutilating myself trying to get microchips out of my body. Now, that's what he wrote on his little detainment form. I had shown him pictures six weeks earlier mm -hmm. of bruises, scratches, um, marks that indicated I was being tortured remotely. And he uses that six weeks later to come to my house with the warrant saying that he had observed this and he had concern and he wanted me to be examined at a hospital. But the, the point and the problem was they had not consulted a judge for an emergency detainment. He used what he said was some old rule on the books that allowed them to do that under an emergency circumstance. However, you don't wait six weeks if it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. but he and his lieutenant and the officer came into my home. I had called uh, Dr. Oliver Williams, who is the director of the Institute Against Domestic Violence in the African-American community, and told him that they were at my door. So at that, while, I'm talking, and while I'm talking to him, they came in. So he said, well, what does the warrant say? I said, he won't let me see it. So at that point, he handed it to me. And, I, and that's when I read what he said. Mm -hmm. And the first, Dr. Williams' first question to me is, where are you? I said, I'm in my home. He said, you're where? I said, in my home. Because they were not supposed to be in my home. Mm -hmm. The warrant didn't give them a, uh, anything, said nothing about an invest, uh, a, a search. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Dr. Williams told me, he said, go with them, call your lawyer and call the domestic violence advocate because I had been um, making reports and communicating with a domestic violence agency in this, in this town. Mm -hmm. So I, I turned around and, and said to the man, well, I need to get my purse and my shoes. And he said, well, I'll get it for you. Walked into my bedroom without a search warrant, came out of my bedroom, searching through my purse. And he, on his way into my bedroom, he said, do you still have that gun? I said, well, we've never discussed the gun. So I knew immediately this was more set up so that they could claim that I maybe yes. tried to do something if he, you know, if they wanted to shoot me or something. The whole thing, I mean, sort of smacks of um, the wrong th wrongful action, you know. First of all, whoever said that a police person could just open the door and walk into somebody's house without an invitation? Actually, you know what, when I'm, when I'm listening to this, um, the, the police officer who, who signed the warrant and who, who came to your home twice, that was, you said Jeffrey Taylor, is that right? That's correct. So Mr. Jeffrey Taylor has something coming for him now because this, I mean, everything he did was not just illegal, it was criminal, right? Everything, as you pointed out, if somebody is really somebody's that, you know, um, mentally, then you don't stress them out with these early morning raids. But what they did with you was it was entirely targeted to humiliate you. And that's exactly what they did with me in Manchester. You know, they, I didn't even talk to police officers. They, they were that concerned about my mental health. You don't send the woman off into the night, you know, out of, onto the motorway and say, bye, see you whenever, and then turn up, you know, two and a half hours later. No, with me, they were also waiting. They were hoping I would be, you know, 20 minutes to midnight. I would be in my nightgown in bed in my hotel room. Fortunately, I was still working, you know, but that's the entire point. It is, it is humiliation and more than that, sexual humiliation because mm -hmm. nakedness always features. So Mr. Jeffrey Taylor will track him down wherever he is in Tennessee and will make his career very difficult because I tell you another thing. Hmm? His, his, well, career actually, his career actually ended um, mm -hmm. in 2012, a year later. He got demoted from that incident, I think, uh, to corporal. And for at least 11 months, he was a corporal instead of a sergeant. But then right after he got his uh, status back, 
in 2012, he come to my house again. This time it's at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. and, and this time it's to give me a citation for filing false reports. And mm -hmm. false report is what he said on his statement. He said, she says that she is being attacked by satellites. But he had already made the statement to me a week or two earlier that there are satellites all around you. I never one time mentioned being attacked, I don't think, by satellites. But that's what he wrote on the citation that he gave me. And he wanted me to sign it, and I said no. And he said, well, if you don't sign it, then I'm going to arrest you. So I did sign it, and I signed my name, and I also wrote on the, on the warrant under duress. It's important that we understand that when they make us sign things that you write under the rest, that means something to the court system. It means you're being forced to do something against your will. That citation was a felony, y'all. It could have got me thrown out of seminary. Mm -hmm. And it was designed to keep me from moving from the area, which is what I was about to do. I was about to move to Dayton to go to seminary. Um, so I to ended up stay in town for a year. Exactly. And obviously, it kept me close enough for them to do their training as well as close enough to that person who uh, was able to do a lot more things to me because I was in much closer proximity. Mm -hmm. This is, you know what, this is a, this is an absolute gold mine because, you know what, in the olden days when, um, you know, databases weren't quite as advanced, people would just, you know, take these reports and then, you know, discard all the names and then focus on the case maybe and, you know, your victim testimony. But we're now in the 21st century. And what I'm saying is Mr. Jeffrey Taylor, even if he's left, he left a digital trail, right? And that's what we're after. Because Mr. Jeffrey Taylor, from his behavior, tells me already that he will leave us, lead us to many more people who are involved. And that's what we're after. So we're going to track down Mr. Jeffrey Taylor before too long. And we'll look very carefully at everything that he did in that time and since then. Because you know what? My interactions with um, Memphis FBI were so irregular. And any sort of irregularity is an indication for capture end of story so there's capture and the fbi in memphis and looking at the past history of memphis and looking at what's statistically most likely i would say that there's some child trafficking going through washing through memphis and let's just have a look if mr jeffrey taylor isn't somehow involved in pedophilia child trafficking try child trafficking or other such things because usually they are there has to be some sort of mechanism by which Mr. Jeffrey Taylor is somehow incorporated into this architecture of crime that he did that to you not once, but twice, right? He must have some sort of tentacles that he was again promoted and then recruited straight away to pull off this bullshit. So Mr. Jeffrey Taylor's digital data will lead us to a lot of people. And I would bet my innards that it will lead us also to some pedophile rings or drug running. In mm -hmm. And in fact, and in fact, part of the story, part of Millicent's story does touch the whole issue of pedophilia and child sex trafficking. And, you know, actually to go back to backtrack just a little bit, we need to, just to stay went off to the Air Force and got all this training and then put his training to use, secured a contract with, we don't know who exactly, but it could be the DIA, it could be, uh, it could be the Air Force, it could be um, the DCS, which is Defense Clandestine Services, it could be any one of the um, federal agencies like NGA, which is the National Geospatial Agency, or the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, or it could be, um, you know, NASA. For, you know, I, I have no idea. It could be any one of these because the use of satellites is involved, the use of tracking ships is involved, the use of V2K and radio transmissions is involved. Um, and the use of nanobiosensors in the body is involved as well. Um, and that, you know, it's a whole can of worms. There's like literally, at, Millicent is at the hub and she's being used for a whole train, it appears, of covert clandestine research projects, which involve multiple federal agencies, defense agencies, and defense contractors, and, 
universities. You know, there are actually universities working, possibly undercover, you know, uh, or under covered agencies, under the protection of covered agencies, in covert ops, you know, with covert ops black budgets. They are working, doing things like dis disease detection, disease monitoring across vast spaces, literally, because there are frequencies in Millicent's body that have been found that are actually being projected across from places like Azerbaijan, force and military bases in Turkmenistan and Kyrgyzstan and Azerbaijan, you know, and the same frequencies that are related to defense contractors like Mitri systems and universities like Princeton and Stanford and the White Rose Research Consortium, which, which is a whole bunch of universities. Um, so all of, these, all of these different entities appear to be involved. So when you look at that, it, this is not just one crime, you know, it's like a multiplicity of crimes that are being covered and that are being sheathed. Um, so you have this person who's actually pulled this off, who's got this grant, who's got this project, and he's doing it. He's being paid, literally, to torture and persecute Millicent night and day, 24-7. And he's been doing it since three, right, Millicent, when the high-tech torture really started? 2003 is when the high-tech torture started, but it was 1996 that my cousin told me, they've told us we can blame anything on you, 1997. Right was when her sister said, the devil is playing with your mind. And when mm -hmm. he's playing with you, he's going to destroy you. And when mm -hmm. they open you up after you're dead, they'll find that all of your organs have been stressed. Stress is mm -hmm. the operative word because stress mm -hmm. is the Research Laboratory is constantly investigating to see how soldiers and airmen are, uh, respond to the pressure that they be that they find themselves of, of continuous stress correct yes right. absolutely and so and you've got um all of this going on um start in the 90s and this is the actual the, actually i'm glad you mentioned that melissa because that brings in the whole issue of how the whole town appears to be involved and appears to be in the know and this actually brings us back to that issue of the civil defense test i mean is that civil defense test code something to project the idea that the that um, a, a kind of system, a surveillance system, um, is being tested out. And this surveillance system involves implants. It involves radio frequency. It involves certain people being kept tabs on. It, in other words, it involves targeting of the kind that you and I know at this point in time. You know, so, and, uh, and is everybody else being told that the country is being secured and is in lockdown because we have these terrorists on the loose and we need to protect ourselves from them through these means. I mean, what exactly is going on? I'm sort of speculating here. So it, it because the whole town has been involved, they have been told stories. In fact, Millicent found out that um, the guy who's actually persecuting her, his sister, called a meeting with the chief of police in the town and the and everybody various other people right Millicent why why did they get together and start talking about Millicent why is the chief of police involved what what was what transpired in that meeting so Millicent has tried to find out what on earth transpired in that meeting did you want to talk about that Millicent it I learned about it just by the slip of, of the tongue of my sister who said to me that this guy's sister had called them to a meeting at the chief of police's office. Now understand this guy's sister is not a member of the police force. Mm -hmm. She does not work for city hall. Why is she allowed to call my children, my mother, my sister and my former pastor to a meeting? And I asked my sister, did she attend the meeting? She said, yes. So mm -hmm. why is she in the police department asking questions about me or my involvement or my my complaint against her brother why did she never approach me about it and she never has to this day now i don't know how many years ago that was i don't know if that was in 2011 or 12 because january 2012 i did file a uh, for a order of protection person and it was from microwave and electronic devices so the i still am yet to learn the content of that meeting 
But what my sister said to me in a text message, she said, essentially, Tommy Goats said that you were nuts. Tommy Goats, mm -hmm. the chief of police. Um, mm -hmm. So he's talking to my family about my mental health status after and possibly, possibly after a lawyer had written to his department and told him that they could not make such diagnoses because their training does not carry them in that direction. And let me say that former Chief Tommy Goats was indeed a high school graduate. Not anywhere do I know of any, um, any college education. Now, Catherine, I did file a federal lawsuit after it took a year, almost right at a year, for that um, citation for filing false reports to be dismissed and my record mm -hmm. exposed. Listen, it went straight to my to my criminal record. Mm -hmm. Yes, and actually going back to that moment, we should also mention that you were taken off once again to the ER and a doctor checked you out, right? A psychiatrist. You spoke to a psychiatrist, correct? And now you want to are you talking about in 2011 or 2012? Well, why don't you talk about the second situation? Because the, when the, the filing false reports claim and when you were held back for eight days. OK, the second, um, when, he, when Sergeant Taylor got his, his status back to Sergeant again, he came, I told you, at 11 o'clock at night. And he says, I'm, I'm giving you a citation for filing false reports. Um, and the false reports was that I was being attacked mm -hmm. by satellites except that was not a statement again that I had made. And you will find if you will go and look at police misconduct, that it is not uncommon for the police department to accuse the victim of st saying statements that they themselves have made. And that's what he was doing to me. For, for background information though, Sergeant Jeffrey Taylor had told me at his first visit to my home, or maybe the second, that he had been in Marines intelligence and that he had helped the Marines do LSD experiments on the Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. And that's MK Ultra. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he also told me that he knew about my history. And he said to me of the person that I was complaining about, does he have a circle of friends? Do they get together and compare data? Mm -hmm. And the other thing he told you was about the microchips. He did indeed. I had I had fallen down a hillside um, the year before. Actually, I was knocked down a hillside. I, I was hit on my ankle by a laser that made me fall down a steep hillside face first. My chin hit the ground, and so I actually could have become a paraplegic from that accident, from that fall. Pray, gratefully, I did not. However, he said to me, did you have to go to the hospital when that happened? And December of the year before, I was I was broadsided in a, a car accident, which was also, um, y'all understand what where I'm headed, which was also a, yeah. a setup. So he said, they if you had to go to the hospital when you had that car accident, and go to surgery, he says they put chips in you when when you go to surgery. So he said all of that during that particular night. Gratefully, I had another TI on the phone who lived in another state, and she heard the entire conversation. So she did document what she had heard. Um, so he admits to you that he knows all about this type of program and then has mm -hmm. the, the gall to fabricate uh, accusations against you that you're mentally ill because you imagine mm -hmm. what he has already confirmed to you. That is just preposterously evil. Mm -hmm. it's it's even better than that it's even better than that because um sorry i i you know i had so much to do i didn't actually keep a de as detailed a tab on your case medicine as i should have so i forgot this detail that jeffrey taylor was actually an intelligence officer army intelligence was that right marine 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 even better here it comes now the thing is that what we see in all countries is that we have, and I'm sorry about the word, I just can't bring myself to use pedophilia because it just sounds so nice. We have basically this huge infrastructure set up for kiddie fuckers in government. Now this takes a lot of children and a sophisticated supply chain. 
And it begs the question of how the hell do these children disappear? How are they transported? How they come into the country? And we're talking large quantities, right? So a city like London needs a serious supply chain to actually provide the children for all the pedophilia. And when you have, you know, human sacrifice, which happens apparently abundantly, you know, these children die. So you need, a, you need to refresh the supply nonstop. Now, the question is, question number one is, how the hell can this go on without MI5 figuring it out in decades, right? Simple data analysis question, which immediately follows that MI5 is running it. And should anybody have any you know, yeah. doubts about it that you can go back and listen to all the accusations against heads of MI5 and MI6 in, in past, you know, um, cases where they were, you know, in on it, you know? So there we go. So this means that when you have MI5 and MI6 running it, um, it follows that military bases are used to store the children. And military kit and military transport is used to transport the children. Now, Mr. Jeffrey Taylor already has a, sh a lot of shit on, on, its, you know, on his boots through your case, but now through the link to intelligence, you know, marine intelligence, it goes right back to the kiddie fuckers and the supply chain, right? And as they found um, one of the uh, mainstream media articles that mentioned, you know, the, the uh, discovery of um, chips inside um, people, it was actually a human trafficking victim where they found one of the chips, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's what chips are used for. They chip the children and they chip um, the women and also some guys who they use for human trafficking to um, keep track of the goods in transport. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's how the, these psychopaths think about people. They are objects. So, mm -hmm. you know, just like you heard about um, probably these very, very small chips that you can now spray on and put into any sort of product that mm -hmm. you sell, you know, not just iPhones, but also, you know, um, any sort of even cans, you know, cans of food and anything you want to chip, you can do that now. And you can have one of the technologies that was advertised is you chip all your products. So when you have a big Walmart, you just send an electromagnetic pulse listen um, to the echo and you can do an inventory every day really quickly by just you know these chips in the products that's how the technology mm -hmm. was advertised now you can do the same thing by chipping children right and you send an electromagnetic pulse through the military base and you know where the children are and we you know who is there and who is right so this is sadly this is how these chips are actually use because the children are higher value products than ipads and iphones you know so the mm -hmm. chips will be put into them first actually because they're higher value goods um but through that um because the intelligence lots are it seems in charge of the supply chain you know mr jeffrey taylor has just led us to another link where, where how we can get him because I bet you that this is exactly the kitty fucking architecture, you know, that connects him to the people who are in charge of the federal grounds that your abuser got and now mm -hmm. are taking care through this link via Mr. Jeffrey Taylor of harassing you and trying to keep you silent. But the system is connected. So we're looking for yes. the connections. Yes, and that's exactly what I found out working on Millicent's article, you know, the very fact that the police are behaving in this fashion and the very fact that the entire town has been brought in on it and has been turned against Millicent with all sorts of stories and lies circulated, you know, and in fact, she found out that one of the stories that was being circulated was that she is stalking Mr. Wolf, I've called him Wolf, by the way, in my article, Barrett Wolf. So Mr. Wolf is supposedly, I mean, I stopped short of calling him Rascal Wolf or something equally <laughs> ridiculous, you know. <laughs> I gave him a decent first name. He should be grateful. Uh, but, but Mr. Wolf, you know, has is the one who stalked her from 1988 when she turned him down when she said look buzz off i don't want to have a re relationship with you you know you're turning out to be an absolute schmuck goodbye you know and he couldn't take that gracefully and disappear from her life he decided i'm gonna get you i'm gonna spend my entire life i'm gonna become an obsessive rat in a rat hole and i'm gonna spend my entire life trying to figure out how to get you and he did malignant that is narcissist exactly, what he did. exactly totally Malignant narcissistic wanker, but you know, <laughs> not, in the, not in the official diagnostics. And you know, throw in megalomaniac psychopath as well. And you know, 
frankly, the things that he has said to Millicent, both to her face and via V2K, will blow your mind. I have some of those choice quotes in the article, by the way. So do go and read the article. Um, one of the things he's come to is um, he said things like, um, I want the whole town to bow to me. And yes, I know I'm delusional, but it's too late. I can't be stopped. Things and you like know, that. I, I brought up with Captain Potts, I said, if you take this man in and have him psychologically evaluated, you know, uh, you'll find out that he's a psychopath. Is it not worth the effort? I mean, taking Millicent in for complaining about being victimized is okay. But taking the victimizer in to see if it's possibly true is not okay. It, that makes, makes no sense whatsoever. Which really brings up the question, who are they protecting, you know? And it comes back to this whole thing of the town being involved, the town being told stories. And Millicent suddenly, here, here's a classic case of blaming the victim. Thing, the victim. Turning, turning around and saying, Millicent is stalking Mr. Wolf. It's important to, to, to say here that uh, the Mount Pleasant Police Department was contacted by Dr. Cynthia Spanier, mm -hmm. who is yes. a psychologist from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. After the first time they took me to the hospital, which, by the way, I was released in two hours. The doctor said he saw no reason for me to be there. But Dr. Spanier mm -hmm. called them and said to them that she had talked to me that I am a victim of domestic violence. And that she was, you know, calling them because it was her opinion that my life is in danger. Now, if mm -hmm. you look at even my health from 2011 to now and how much it's proven that what's happening to me is a, is a result of trauma, traumatic assault, you was, Dr. Mm -hmm. Spaniel was telling the truth. And she spoke to uh, Sergeant Jack Burgett and, and, and Sergeant Burgett wrote what she said, except she left, he left out, if she said it, other words about this person that, she, that Dr. Spanier said to me, and that he is a narcissistic abuser, a sociopath. That's, that was her opinion. Now, whether she said that to, doc, to a Sergeant Brigett, I'm not sure. It's also important to understand that I did file a federal lawsuit against Mount Pleasant Police Department, and it was for all my civil rights violations. Uh, mm -hmm. I did that pro se because I did not have money for a lawyer. And it's hard to find a lawyer in this area or any yeah. other area, I think I understand, that is going to be of the kind of integrity that will follow through. And even if he is integrious, uh, the system will... And standing up to the deep state, essentially, you know. Lawyer, lawyers are afraid to stand up. Yeah, we'll begin to mess with their lives and their families and their business. and so that's not something I guess that we can really complain about. However, I put all of those documents in the federal courthouse. I wanted to make sure they had everything that was going to mean anything to me or anybody else at some point in the future. Uh, all of the ways that they violated my civil rights, all the ways that the color of law was implemented when it was absolutely illegal. Mm -hmm. And it I, I managed to stay in the court for a year before it got dismissed. And the federal court dismissed the federal charges, but they remanded the state charges uh, as an option for me to take back to state court. When I went to state court and I did file the complaint in state court for the state uh, part of the state statutes that had been violated, the city uh, went to bat and began to, to focus on a municipality charge, but I was able to show them that these these uh, crimes were committed to me by these men as individuals, not just a municipality. Also, it's important to say that, and my my brain is being messed with right there. Well, uh, do you remember the judge as well? The the um the judge for that case turned out to be an attorney that had actually defended Mr. Wolf earlier. When you're trying to bring the order of protection against them. Right. In state court, they assigned the case to the person who is now a judge. And in 2012, when I filed for order of protection, he was this person's attorney. 
I believe that he was deliberately chosen because they knew of the association. Mm -hmm. And he would not recuse himself until I found a motion for that. When he did finally recuse himself, he assigned the case to a friend to a judge that had just entered the bar in this, well, entered the court system in Murray County. And that judge obviously was already told what the outcome was supposed to be. But after I filed the federal lawsuit, just before I filed the federal lawsuit, Tommy Goats, who was the chief of police in Mount Pleasant, he quit. Um, Mr. Westmoreland, who was the investigator for the Mount Pleasant Police Department, and he told me himself that he was also a Marine, he quit. And after I filed the, the police, uh, the, uh, the federal suit, then Sergeant Jeffrey Taylor quit, as did now Sergeant Amy Dean. And Amy Dean was the domestic violence uh, representative for the Mount Pleasant Police Department, who said without seeing me that it was her, her opinion that I was uh, a danger to myself and others. And actually, that's what made me go to a lawyer. And that's what made the lawyer right the police department, that, was, that statement had to come out of my file. That was her opinion and she did not say in any way that she had any training that gave her permission or any kind of background by which she made that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It can't be called a diagnosis. It was the musings of an imbecile, really. Well, she and also, it, it, she it, also it, left the force. Mm -hmm. And it was a deliberate attempt really to stop you to delay you from going on to Ohio to get started on your doctorate program. And by the way, I should point out to everybody, you know, Millicent is the most extraordinary person. She has gotten a master's degree pretty late in life, and she started on her doctorate when she was 60. These are not the signs of a delusional person. These are not the signs of a mad person. Millicent is like the most extraordinary researcher that, that I, any of us have ever met, really. She's the most amazing detective, really, because she really hones in on a subject and she figures things out. She goes after it, you know, every angle. And, and the other thing she really is that many people don't know, but that, but that I hope that my article will introduce them to is she's a brilliant writer. I quoted an entire section from Millicent's letter. Um, I forget who it was to. Oh, yes, it was a Senate Judiciary Committee. Right, Millicent, all inspector. Leahy. Leahy, yeah. So that letter, we have to post online, Millicent, in PDF format in full. That is the most brilliant, the most astounding letter I have ever read, demanding that anybody in the Senate take action. And I can't believe that anybody could receive a letter like that and not immediately take action, not immediately pick up the phone, not immediately do something. Because the things that Millicent said in that are just beyond, uh, you know, incredible, just absolutely fabulous because she actually gets to the heart of the matter and she says, pretty much like we did in our memo to Trump, by the way, she says, you know, this is slavery. This is enslavement. This is enslavement, you know. This is not what America stands for. And this, I thought we'd come past that. Where are our civil rights? Where are my human rights? She asked really pertinent questions. So you know, I, I would love to have a copy of that on my website as well, you know, if, if that's okay. You do have it. You do have it. Actually, I wrote that letter in, in 2007, and I filed it in my county courthouse. So this year, I, and, and I also wrote a letter to the local in, law enforcement agencies. I wrote it to the police department in Mount Pleasant in Columbia. I wrote that letter to the city managers for those two cities, to the sheriff, the county sheriff, and also to the county mayor. So that was 10 years ago. This year, I wrote a, a follow-up letter and said, 10 years have passed. These things are continuing to happen. My, my, my health is in more distress than than 10 years ago, obviously. And I asked again, will you review this letter and will you answer these questions? Is due process still a, a, a law? Is the Constitution still in, in action? Has slavery been reenacted and we not know about it? <laughs> you know what? I actually, you know, I, I apologize. I apologize that I haven't picked up on this letter, but that's because Millicent has the most comprehensive documentation. Oh, really? 
Yes, and many of her letters are as powerful. Work through. So, you know, it's absolutely amazing. And every single item of that is a total bombshell. So I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm very, very sorry that I, you know, asked you again for a document you already sent me. Because, um, but I want to put that up online because people need to see this. And then the next step will be, because now we're so beyond having to prove that these crimes exist. You know, we're so beyond having to prove that chips and bodies exist because we found tons of them, you know, everywhere around the world. Now we are yeah. turning around, the herd is turning, and now we're going after the people who kept silent, you know, and who have been covering this up. So now I just want to have... And who are still doing it. Still covering up. I mean, look at the silence around us, you know, in mainstream media, alternative media. Look, look at how people are refusing to respond. Absolutely. But you know, that's coming to an end. I, you know, you and I and the rest of us and everybody else who's watching, who's off the same mind, and at this particular point in time, to bring them down, to absolutely bring them down and to, and force, to force this out into the open, to force this issue out into the open. Absolutely. And, what, and what we're not going to stop. Sorry. I'm sorry. I was just <laughs> reading. I was just saying, we're not going to stop. <laughs> I think they sometimes amuse themselves with, you know, to tweaking the audio delay between yeah. Europe and the US to set up these things where we then pipe up simultaneously and that's, they find that funny. But anyway, um, I think one of the things that also occurred to me is that um, another thing that's also we should do because um, there's absolutely no one who is um, immune against corruption and that includes judges. So we will also go after the judges who did this because we have already met a string of corrupt judges. For example, I mean, you know, I can back up everything that you said because in my case, it was Judge Holgate of the High Court in London that threw out my case despite the fact that I had experienced an assassination attempt, received death threats, and I was made to collapse in front of my husband after the first hearing by MI5. And he threw out my case and his argumentation was, that he didn't strike out a claim because there was no claim to start with because none of my papers had the precise combination of words, particulars of claim. So that's how ridiculous it can get, right? So, you know, the way that Millicent's um, um, case was thrown out, we'll look at, at it very carefully and we'll now begin to go after the judges. Because again, just like in the case of Jeffrey Taylor, you know, the judges too are involved with the kitty fucking. Right. And any sort of irregularity, again, is an indication of capture. And the question is always, how do the intelligence agencies bribe or blackmail these people to to behave irregularly, behave mm. corruptly for them in a concerted manner? And, you know, whoever doesn't believe that this can be the case, please look at the case of um, the death of Justice Scalia, who I think was found dead at a kitty fucking ranch. Right. Mm. They were the images I've seen of the ranch had like devil's heads around the rooms. There were little beds in front of every door set up in series. So children, it looks like, were being gravely mistreated. And not just that, I've also read reports that the owner of the ranch was also involved with some shady dealings in Latin America or something like that. I have to look it up because I didn't investigate, you know, the Scalia case, thank goodness, I would like to say, because I think that's a can of worms. But to the highest level, the judges too are involved in, in this. And there's a, there's a reason. Because in the, um, well, if you, if you approach the system with the um, neutral mindset, you would think that the best people got promoted to the top and therefore the likelihood of finding a pedophile um, and a brutal serial killer at the top of the judiciary would be, you know, very unlikely. But this is not how the system works because the system has been in de deep capture for centuries and the crime cartel that runs it has been promoting up criminals on purpose mm -hmm. so that they can control them. So the top of the judiciary is the place where you're most likely to find serial killers and pedophiles. Anything that can actually create a control file will promote these people up. And it, now the question is only, it's not, are there any pedophiles at the top of the judiciary? No, the question is how many there are. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the only question. So no one should be surprised if a you know, Supreme Court judge of the US and elsewhere is accused of shady things. You have to expect it. The probability for that is extremely high. So it's not just an option for us to go after the judges. We have to go after the judges because um, 
you know, in, in many areas, in these areas, but also in the family courts, where they have been instrumental in removing children from their parents. For example, in the UK, the family courts are famous for their arbitrary decision making. Oh, the They're same even, here. Yeah, exactly. They're even, you know, the, the Supreme Court judges of the UK sometimes go around and give speeches, which is brilliant because they actually do have a voice and they can, they can really help us change this for the better. And one of them is on record, you know, stating publicly that the family courts are rather, you know, um, a field on themselves. I mean, they put it very politely, but what it means, it is randomness to facilitate the kitty fucking yeah. architecture, which is horrific. But it's there for everybody to see, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to go after the judges. So in my case, you know, Judge Colgate has got something coming and I'll take care of that. And in Millicent's case, we'll go after the judges because what they've yeah. essentially been doing is aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and that, as you pointed out, Millicent, in your case, it's like there's the police, there's the court system, the judges, and then you have certain staff not everybody but certain staff in the hospitals as well you know not every doctor because you've encountered some good doctors right Millicent but a nurse who came after for instance on that particular occasion the doctor comes talks to you and says I don't see why you're here you need to go home and then nurse supposedly from crisis intervention comes along and has a chat with you and writes down that you're delusional record in your file and and this nurse this nurse by the way Catherine comes back to the court system this nurse is married to a judge bingo <laughs> there we go you now, see now let's just let's just guess what sort of investigation we shall be running on that judge right what no, no 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 they're not all bad they are not all bad in fact that particular judge after I wrote him a letter I could not get my lawyer to one asked the judge to recuse himself and two i couldn't get him to introduce certain evidence into the court system they in this county y'all and and the federal court told me that this county is the worst county in the state she said nobody likes to work whole court in in murray county because they do things their own way but this particular judge i wrote him uh, and, and sent him my documents that proved that I knew what I was talking about and that I was innocent. And he told me, had his secretary tell me that they had to get permission from my lawyer for the judge to open the envelope because it was against the law. But I couldn't get my lawyer to, to, to introduce him into the court. So when then my lawyer quit. <laughs> he quit. But the judge said, I will prepare the, the dismissal paperwork myself if I have to. He gave, I told him that I had work waiting for me, that I was being held up from leaving. He gave me permission to leave. He said, when you get settled, he told the a clerk to give me the dis, um, expungement paperwork. He said, when you get settled, send me this paperwork filled out with your address. I will sign it and we'll send it back to you. So that got me cleared with the university. You know, I mean, with the seminary, I could have not gotten in, into the seminary and they were not going to let me stay if I had anything on mm -hmm. a record anything mm -hmm. uh, they, they were the ones that contacted me and told me that it had been it had been posted it was not to have been posted because i was supposed to have been innocent to proven guilty but it was already posted on a federal crime report wow so, yes and the seminary notified me that they had seen it i didn't know it was there but they said you know what is this you've got to get it cleared up they were going to put me out so i did the judge did Signed it, he, and he expunged the, the uh, crime report, um, and 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 asked me to pray for him. He said, "And and please do pray for me." So he, they're not all bad. The, the police from the, the police department. It was mm -hmm. police sergeant uh, Burgett who suggested that I have the sleep study. Mm. I agree. I agree, Millicent. I sorry. I just didn't. I didn't mean to imply that because also in my case, for example, Judge Spencer, the first one, he was genuinely shocked. Right. I mean, I could mm -hmm. tell, you know, it's absolutely no, no, I'm not saying they're yeah. all bad, but the, the judge who helped you was not the husband of the nurse, was he? He was. Oh, it, he, what? Really? He that was? was the husband of the nurse? Well, that, I think that I'm marrying each other in your state. I didn't understand that. So sorry, the nurse, oh, Marks, who is mentally ill and her husband helps you to have your lawyer dismissed. 
a year later, right? A year later. Her, her, her husband, yeah, her husband actually says he would prepare the dismissal paperwork himself if he had to. And okay, he did but, but then again, he was preparing the dismissal paperwork for your lawyer, leaving you to represent yourself. I mean, he's pretty glad to help you with that, you know, stand there totally on his own. I mean, I want to, I want to hear from him saying like, oh, I'm going to help you with your case if you represent yourself, even if I have to do the legal investigation myself. That would be something I would be like, okay, thumbs up. It's like, oh, you know, your lawyer's being dismissed. Let me just help you to expedite the paperwork, yeah. you know? Well, let me tell you again that Murray County is one tenth the size of Memphis, Tennessee, and yet Murray County in 2013 had more domestic violence cases than any city in the state. And the domestic violence a a um, agency's lawyer, well, she actually was the director of, of our the, uh, domestic violence center, but she was also an attorney. She was quoted in the newspaper by saying, "The reason that there are so many." domestic violence cases in the court system is because of the court system, because the police investigators, the, the police department, and because of the prosecutor. They really do turn a deaf ear on the cries of the women in this in this town and in this county. Uh, gee, we've I, I told you all before about a, a, a an ex-police officer who was also an army that stopped and murdered a, a medical doctor. Yeah. And and he killed himself. Um in 2012, there was a, a man who killed his wife, her two daughters, and, and himself. So, mm -hmm. and, and all of these people are crying out, begging for help. They're begging, begging for protection, and we get none. Listen, the National Network to End Domestic Violence Safety Net team told me to tell our local police department, both in Columbia and in Mount Pleasant, that they would teach them, they would train them in how to solve a cybercrime. Mm -hmm. neither one of them <laughs> and I'm just talking about computer hacking cell phone hacking that kind of thing they don't even want to they don't even want to know how to solve the easy crime and and that's the people who didn't want to know was that chief pot so I talked to all his predecessor that was what well, no chief pot because chief that, pot. that was last, last year last year I, I sent him the email from from the national network uh to end domestic violence, the safety net team. I sent him the email and said, yeah. these people say they will help you. They will educate you. Right, they right. get federal funds to educate police departments in solving cyber crimes in domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both Karen, Karen and I talked to Chief Potts and none of us were impressed. Like, not impressed is the British polite way of putting it, you know? Yes, I did report on the fact that you spoke to him and he actually said that Millicent hadn't provided any evidence. <laughs> Which, which was laughable. It was not just a lie, it was the ironic lie because I was CC'd in on an email where she sent evidence the day before, you know, to him. And we've all seen the piles of her evidence, you know. Yeah. And this is the thing, and um, I've, I've recorded quite a bit of it in the article, but literally, Millicent has proved that her body is filled up with implants. You know, she's had radio scans done and she's had toxicology analyses done. And her body is filled up with nanobiosensors that are emitting and receiving radio frequencies that can be traced via their specific waveguide signals to specific kinds of nanobiotech that are being specifically researched by specific universities. So, and that are coming from specific army bases. So there's yeah. a real trade, there's a trail there. There's an absolute trail there, you know? And so all of this is proof, all of this is evidence. And uh, apart from that, there, there's other things. There's x-rays where they found a transponder in her, or it looks like a transponder in her upper jaw. There are, um, there's a nuclear magnetic resonance scan of her, of her heart, which shows an artifact embedded in the basal wall of of her, of her heart um you know what i gosh it's, gosh she you know had what? a scar she wakes yeah. up one morning she has a scar on her on her chest and she has this guy's voice in her head saying i want you to lie down on your right side for eight hours you've just had cardiac surgery just imagine living through that horror right incredible just, yeah let me remind you all this is the 
ear. This is the static maker that is to combat the mm -hmm. Morse code that was found in my ear um, onto my brain mm -hmm. three weeks ago. I've been wearing this almost 24 hours a day to try and break up the Morse code that is being used to send radio frequencies to my brain that would allow someone to speak directly to my brain day and night. You know what, and, and also I want everybody to understand, I want people to, who are watching this to understand two things. So number one, everything that Millicent says, all of us can back up. For example, when I went to attend the court hearing of um, Dr. Stephen Frost in the UK, in Manchester, MI5 amused themselves with remote controlling my heart. I was sitting in the court hearing and one hour into a court hearing, my heart didn't just start racing. It was step by step ramped up, then it was switched off. And then exactly 15 minutes later, they did the same thing again. And you're sitting there and someone races your heart to the point as if you were running a race and then switches it off, right? So I have got one of these pacemakers in my heart as well. And these degenerates then amuse themselves with that sort of stuff, right? And once you have a remote control chip in your body, like medicine has, like I have, like other people suspect they have, they can be controlled from anywhere. So then they are shipped out to universities who do so-called the research. But I tell you, it's not research. It's bullshit. It's just bullshit. And actually what it is, it's also, hmm, sorry? Call it, you know, that, that needs to be appropriately established. It's torture. It is torture. It is torture. And it's, yes. it's, you know, it's more than that. It is, it is human trafficking because I think this. And it's non-consensual. Yeah. Absolutely. It's non-consensual. It's non-consensual human experimentation and it's torture. Yeah, you know what, and that's exactly it because certainly it's none of it is unconsensual, but I, I, I balk at calling it even human experimentation because it puts a scientific gloss on. You know, the sex ratio doesn't agree with experimentation. You would want to have men, women equal, and instead we've got 70 to 80% women. And what they are doing, it's a more, it tallies more with the sexual arousal of psychopaths, you know, so it's human trafficking. And, oh, and yeah, the, okay. you know, I know um, Paul is getting uh, impatient because I think we're all running, but I just well, want people to right. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The Kathy. last sentence I want people to understand is that medicine has been put through the seer torture training. And in the, at the same time, she did a master thesis and the PhD. She is not just a Navy SEAL. She's an uber Navy SEAL because I never met a Navy SEAL capable of writing a PhD while being tortured, right? So medicine is something extraordinary here. And people have to understand that because the pain that you feel when you have these chips in your body and the insanity that they do with you, I mean, it's, you cannot understand it unless you've been tortured yourself. Yes, and I think we should we should stress really that you know universities are doing this research as you said um catherine and but they're essentially engaging and condoning torture yeah exactly exactly and you have to yeah. you have to remember this all reports up to a sex cult i mean if you look at the freemasons they all wear aprons you've mm -hmm. seen them that apron is to uh protect the holiest of holies so it all uh, goes back to sex. It all goes back oh my to trafficking. Goodness. And uh, that's where it goes. We're going to have to bring it to a close. We can do this again next time. There's so much information on Nelson. Yes. Uh, Paul, can I add one thing? Well, sure you can. Uh, since you brought up the, the Holy of Holies, the, the space of a woman's body below the waist is of, of extreme interest to the torturers. That's why I, I received the most torture constantly. I was sitting in a courtroom. The, in fact, it was the day that I um, was having the hearing of, for the order of protection. I was being sexually manipulated two thirds of the time that I was sitting in that courtroom. All of a sudden, this person got up and walked out of the courtroom and that manipulation stopped. The next year that I was in the courtroom having the hearing for the uh, filing false reports. I was so assaulted sexually that I could not stay there any longer. I was allowed to leave 
I went to my the walk-in clinic. They established that my blood pressure was was uh, was raised. I went and had a biofeedback scan that established that my reproductive organs were inflamed. And the next day, I went to my medical doctor who did a, a rape test, and she established that I had been sexually assaulted. She documented that I had been raped. You know, again, Millicent, I second everything you said because I think it was my second hearing in front of, ju in front of Judge Edis um, when there were, I think, three people in the room. It was Mr. Green, Miss Aaron, the two um, barristers for, um, you know, the respondents. And there was this, you know, nondescript, grumpy old guy, you know, trying to intimidate the judge. But when I, when I stood up and I was talking to Judge Edis, what they did with me is that they muscle pulsed my inner thighs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every, all of you know the muscle pulsing, you know, I'm not sure if it's done through the chips that they put into everywhere, you know, or if it's actually, you know, little electromagnetic pulses fired into me. But again, inner thighs, you know, it's this sexual humiliation in front of a judge. They, they literally, we have, and that is MI5 in the UK doing identical stuff to these nut jobs in the, in the US, you know? So Paul is right, it all connects to a, to a sex cult. And there are also whistleblower articles, you know, I can, I can maybe link that, where they tie in the heads of MI6 and MI5, the current ones alive, and they say they are members of a sex cult. Yeah, these people, and that's why I call, you know, it's not military intelligence sections five and six, it's military intercourse sections five and six, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, intelligence is absolutely the wrong word to use for them. I mean, they've got the guts and the gall to use that word. They don't have any intelligence whatsoever. They're engaged in the most dastardly covert ops against humanity, against all of us. Well, let me say that that kind of sexual assault scene did not occur during the first five years of, my, of being targeted. It was after that person retired that the sexual stuff began, and it was indeed often in public places where there were rooms full of men. Wow. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. we're going to have to bring it to a close. Uh, we can go around and say goodbye. Uh, I think every, why don't we start off with just little quick statements and then we can go uh, for this week. Millicent, would you like to start? Well, my statement, I've been looking for my uh, for that document that I sent because I did have it scanned after I got it uh, finished and mailed to the police departments and I do have my my certified mail uh, numbers on the on the document so you all can also be able to track that it, they were received but I'm going to send it to you uh, Mindy so that you can attach it to the broadcast today and that so I was looking for it and I didn't find it but I will send it uh, as soon as we're finished. Thank you very much, Millicent. Karen? Uh, well, I did look a little bit at Millicent's uh, article. I read some of it, you know, kind of scanned through it. And I would tell people to take the time and read it carefully um, because it's a very important uh, document. It is, of course, well done. And um, it will show you that these things are not only from people in high powers, but this can be... Uh, this, this technology can be gotten by the local psych psychopath and who can wreak havoc with an entire town, not just a particular person, but they can hone in on one person and physically destroy that person remotely. So this is a very, very important document to sit down carefully and read and then come back and read it again. And I thank you, Millicent and Ramola, for a brilliant job. It helps everyone, and we hope that it helps Millicent specifically and quickly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Catherine, did you want to say something before I do, or? I, yeah, I, you want you you have to have the last word on this, Ramona. I just wanted to thank thank you for this you know, absolutely amazing and frankly, you know, investigative journalist prize winning piece of work <laughs> that will be generation defining because it, it breaks again, you know, the, the biggest, um, God, the biggest taboo, right? And again, the biggest taboo is, is the, the abuse of women, um, women whistleblowers and also women of foreign heritage, you know, all of us 
fall into that category one way or another. And um, again, it comes back, and Millicent is absolutely right. This is modern day slavery. And I just, I just ask that we just continue this next week because every single topic we can talk about, universities, um, medics, um, psychiatry, and the police ties in with Millicent's case. Mm -hmm. it, it is absolutely just breathtaking. And one of the things I wanted to say to Millicent particularly is that I'm just so honored to have her on the joint investigation team because she is the most extraordinary woman and the most extraordinary Navy SEAL that ever existed in the history of the USA. Really, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I second that absolutely, Millicent. I mean, Millicent is exceptional in every way. And, um, you know, the, the topics that you mentioned, Catherine, are precisely what we should focus on the next time. Electronic slavery, which I've thrown into the title, which I think is so central to, to Millicent's case, and it comes from something that Mr. Wolf said to her. He literally turned to her in, in a car while she was sitting in the car with him and said, um, just that, without any preface, electronic slavery. So, you know, we need to talk about that and about radio hypnosis, which he's using on her and using on the entire town, and radio broadcasting, how radio stations are being used and how radio frequencies are being used to hypnotize a town and how the CIA's MK Ultra plays into the scenario and also the CIA's Manchurian candidacy plays into the scenario because that's what's being leveled against Millicent here as well. So there's really depths and depths that we can go, go into and you know hopefully we'll do that. I'm going to try to clean up the article meanwhile and I, it's, it's posted but I need to, I would like to add a few more graphics and set up a few more links. So I'll do that between now and next week and so hopefully the next few days you'll see the article sort of getting padded a little bit. Okay, if we link up to it, Ramola, will it Will our link incorporate the changes? I think it will. Oh, sure. If you sign up for my RSS feed or, you know, for subscribe to my um, email on my site, you'll get a notification as soon as the article's updated too. Yeah. But, but, okay. and so I, but I can, easily, wait to send, post it I can easily send it to you when it's fully done too. I mean, yeah, of okay. course. The, the URL shouldn't change. I mean, unless you change the title of the URL. I think it's, no. you know, a link will be fine. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, it'll be on Catherine's website, I know. It'll be on Ramon's website. It'll be on our website, pinecodeutopiawordpress.com. And probably if Millicent has one, and she does, I know she does. And Karen, you can put it up too if you'd like. And uh, with that, I'll sign off for another amazing uh, Detective Crime Stoppers Force. Thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much for everybody in the chat and everybody that's watching this. Thank you very much.